Well, thanks, Guy. Uh, I'll tell you, I don't think I've ever been as excited to come and talk. Uh, what a great topic. Soldier athlete. Uh, basically, when I talked to General Jorge, she said, I can just tell sports stories the whole time. <laughs> and uh, you know how it is over time. You were probably, I was like a mediocre athlete, but over time, all of a sudden, you get really good. The stories get better. So, uh, but it is uh, interesting following General McMaster, a uh, tough challenge. We're battle buddies working the future force stuff every day. We were, uh, I was on, uh, on each other's flanks uh, in northern Iraq for a while there as brigade commanders. But it, they got it right because, you know, HR is the 500 pound brain. And, uh, and he was talking, you know, he was uh, on the dean's list. I was on the dean's other list. All right. And uh, I was the uh, sports scholarship. Uh, the only reason I got in West Point is because I averaged 25 points a game in basketball. It had nothing to do with my SAT score or all that other stuff. So, uh, uh, but like many folks in the military, I always, uh, this is a 90% military crowd, but I usually like to try to explain that, uh, you know, not everybody uh, came into the military, grew up from the time they were little, knowing they wanted to go into the military. We come in for all different reasons. Uh, and, you know, some for, uh, you know, obviously most of us are drawn to a, a life of service to something greater than yourself, but there's, you know, to pay for school, different things. Uh, again, for me, I was very fortunate. I was a basketball player in the uh, state of uh, Michigan my last few years, and, uh, and, and I, was, uh, I was okay. There was a guy named, I'm so old, there was a guy named Irvin Magic Johnson. <laughs> no, not that old. Come on now. <laughs> Jeez, at least you know who I'm talking about, you know? I mean, if I was talking about George Mikan or something, half of you wouldn't know who I'm talking about, you know, the, one of the original big men. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, Irvin Magic Johnson was a senior same time I was in Michigan, and uh, he had committed to go to Michigan State, so I was not going to Michigan State because I didn't want to ride the pine. Uh, but I, so I, I was going to go to the University of Michigan. And my father, it's really funny how parents are, you know, my father was like, uh, hey, you know, he's good, but he's getting all the publicity. He's not that good, you know. And so for years I kidded my father. Uh, I said, Dad, he was pretty good. He was pretty good. <laughs> you know, you know, all of us have kids and we think they're the best, you know, but he, he was pretty dang good. Anyway, so I was going to go to the University of Michigan on a basketball scholarship and I and, uh, was pretty, pretty happy with that. And then this guy named Coach Krzyzewski, I couldn't pronounce his name, Coach K., he was the coach at West Point at the time, and he came out to my house. Uh, they'd seen me at a basketball camp in the summer, so he came out to talk to me about this place called West Point. And I'll be honest, I did not even know what it was. I thought when Army played Navy, it was the Army against the Navy, and, and maybe that would be a good thing, incidentally, I'm just saying, you know. Uh, you know, only kidding, we're back, we beat Buffalo, we're on our way, right? Good ball game, we held on to there at the end, very good. But anyway, um, so Coach K talked me into visiting West Point, and honestly, I went to visit, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, the idea, I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. At, uh, it was kind of fate. Like the weekend I visited uh, the basketball program at Michigan, it was they had this giant hash bash, and uh, people walking around everywhere smoking dope. And I thought, holy smokes, this is college. It wasn't really me. I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. Of course, I go to West Point. They take me to a boxing smoker. I see the team, this camaraderie. You know, and I holy, I fell in love with it, and uh, uh, so I feel very fortunate. So I learned more about leadership and uh, team building on the basketball court than anywhere else at West Point. And West Point's a great leadership school. I'm not trying to knock West Point, but uh, you know, Coach K taught us a lot of things. And it was a uh, guy was mentioning, like for example, this guy's worked for me 30 years ago. Somebody stole from Coach K. He'll always let me come down here. It's more effective. He'll always go up to somebody and say, look, you know, you got to play as a team. So if I pick, pick on the big guy here, they go up to somebody like that, it's not going to work. You're just going to break your finger like I broke mine. Are any orthopedic guys in the crowd here? <laughs> anyway, i got to get this finger fixed. I haven't had time. Well, but if you, go at him, if you go at him like this, you're going to be effective, you know, as a team. That sounds simple. But there's guys who worked for me 30 years ago. Hey, sir, I remember the fist. we got to be a team. I remember the fist. And it's really, it really is about, about being a team. So go to the first slide, please. So yeah, there's, uh, those short shorts are coming back, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's why I put that up there. I, I get to talk to the Duke team now just about every year, and I showed them this picture. It was pretty, pretty sad because they recognize Coach K immediately. He looks the exact damn same, and that's from, you know, 37 years ago or whatever. And uh, they didn't even know who I was, and then I told them those short shorts are coming back, and they're all like, oh, God, that's disgusting, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> I've still got them, though, because they're coming back, I'm telling you. 
And then I'm really excited on the right there, that's me. Yes, yes, moments later they stuffed me, but it looks pretty cool there. But notice my knees are bent. That counts in vertical jump. All right? That counts. You can bend the knees and that counts, how high you are off the ground. So I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. Okay, so, uh, but there is a natural connection between sports uh, and the military. We all know that. Think of the phrases you hear, you know, in the foot, you're watching football Sunday, they're in the trenches, you know, the, I mean, every, every phrase is, uh, it's a battle out there. We talk the basics, blocking and tackling, you know, I mean, there's a natural, uh, and so, uh, you know, just sort of building on that today, I'd like to kind of just talk about that and, and compare, let's look at a, at a great athlete and a great soldier, and then let's look at how they compare and how we've treated soldiers historically and how we treat athletes. So the first task is to describe a great athlete. And I'm gonna ask you out here, I'll come down, and just, just what comes to your mind? Just tell me, what do you think of when you think of a great, any sport, a great athlete? What do you got? Coordination. Coordination. Practice. What's that? Practice. practice. So, so what? They practice. Lots of athletes practice. Lots of athletes have coordination. I'm talking a great athlete here. So don't put those up there yet. Those aren't worthy of... <laughs> Everybody practice. I mean, my, you know, a peewee baseball team practices. Team player. Okay, now I can buy team player. They're not out for themselves. They may be, you know, the best on the team. Team player. That's a good one. What other? Discipline. discipline. I like that. Discipline. Because more discipline than, than others. Leadership. That's right. More leadership. They're not just out there as one of the team. A great athlete usually is the one taking control. You think of Michael Jordan, Peyton Manning. You said? Talent. talent. Yeah. So, again, though it's interesting, a lot of folks have talent, but I would, you know, more talent. But okay, but talented. So, did you get all that? It's my eight up there. He looks like he's, he's slow on the take there. I <laughs> Good job, James. Okay, talent, but we had uh, discipline and we had leadership. A leader. Commitment. Leader, there you go. Okay, what else? Commitment. Commitment. And, you know, and again, a lot of folks commit, but, but kind of above and beyond. A great athlete is really committed, right? I mean, that's the, uh, what does Malcolm Gladwell say? The 10,000 hour deal. You know, they're really putting in the time. You look at, yeah, you know, work ethic. So they have a great uh, hard work and committed. What else? Determination, someone said? Yeah, kind of more, they don't want to, she doesn't want to argue it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good one. They, are, they have that, you know, it, that makes them great, that, that extra little amount of determination. What else? Humility. Oh, yeah, 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 I like that, humility. So they, they uh, have perspective. Hi, Patty, how you doing? And uh, uh, what else? Anybody else, anything missing? Yeah. Competitive, yeah, 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 that's a good one. They're highly competitive. They, uh, they don't want to lose. They don't like to lose. Okay, what's that? Support mechanism. So, yeah, they're not on an island by themselves. They have a team that kind of supports them. And you could, that kind of goes along with, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, like resilient. They have support mechanisms, so they're resilient. Would that be fair to say, resilient? The way we look at, okay, resilient. Thank you. <laughs> Talked her into that one. That's true, resilient. Come on, yeah, that's support mechanisms that provide what? They're resilient. Okay, what else? Heart. Yeah, something that's tough to measure, but they got a, a, that definitely makes them a great athlete in any sport, that heart to go above and beyond it. The heart, the other one is kind of, oh, somebody in the back, yeah. Physically fit, very good. I can't believe we didn't mention that one until the end here. I mean, if you know they were way overweight and they had all these things, big deal, they'd be a couch potato, right? So physically fit, okay? All right, so I think that's good. Flip that back down. Now, we took the liberty of writing some attributes of a great soldier to compare, all right? That's why I was steering some of it just a little bit. So flip that back over, the great soldier versus great athlete. Very good, good writing too. Let's hear it for the aid there, up there, look at that. Unbelievable. One of those things that's not in the job description, you know, that you end up doing. So we looked at great soldier, toughness. Did we sort of talk toughness? Eh, not really, but resilient. Eh. Uh, physically superior, we talked that, so that's the same. Resilient, hey, how about that? Resilience on there. <laughs> team player, someone said team player, that's on there. Selfless, which I would, you know, you could stretch a little bit to humility, maybe not. Good under pressure, clutch. We, uh, we talked about that under uh, somewhere. We talked about uh, having that dedication. We talked about dedication, determined. 
expertise for a soldier. Um, you know, not exactly, but you know, eh, no, I don't want, I wouldn't put talented. But I think you can see, you know, obviously you could change the names and it'd almost be accurate for either one. Uh, it's a little, little less, quite honestly, on the great athlete. This is a tough group. Obviously, not many athletes in here. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But when you look at a great athlete or a great soldier, many similarities. Could we all agree on that? Many similarities. And uh, some of them, I think, it's also interesting that we uh, didn't quite think of it that way, and that's part of the problem. And, and my basic... Uh, you know, theory here today is that we need to be much more proactive in the way we treat soldiers. And we need to treat soldiers better than professional athletes. I don't mean in pay, obviously, but more proactive. And when you look, I'm going to look a little bit at the history. Uh, you know, we have to go from reactive to proactive uh, because the way the world has changed. Many of the things that General McMaster was talking about, the com complexity of the future. He probably mentioned, you know, how com we know we're going to face uh, an adversary. We could say situations. It could be a humanitarian assistance disaster response where it's very complex. You know, the challenge uh, when I was young and a lot of the older folks, you know, when we were young, the fog of war was not enough information, right? I mean, you just didn't have it. You, it was easier to have initiative because, like, remember the old do something, do anything, lieutenant? Nobody would second guess you because you barely got any information. You didn't know much. Now what's the fog of war? Too much information. Just a few years ago, I'd ask them there'd be silence. But that's how the world has changed, you know, the, the too much information, overwhelming amounts. And it faces all of us. And so it changes uh, quite a bit. And uh, as we look, the complexity, I mean, just think back over the last 60 days what has occurred in the world. Uh, you could have a crystal ball, you couldn't predict it. You couldn't predict a, a, a civilian airliner being shot out of the sky uh, you know, 32,000 feet, and uh, you couldn't predict what ISIS uh, has done, the barbaric acts they've done. You couldn't predict what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. It'd be very difficult to predict these things, and nobody has a crystal ball. And as former Secretary of Defense Gates said, I mean, we could predict it. We try to predict the future. We get it wrong. But the one, one thing we know we won't get wrong is that it is going to be extremely complex. The enemy will not go after our strengths. They'll go after our weaknesses, and they'll do that even better. They'll adapt. So what can we rely on for that? Our hedge against that is a human dimension. It's a uh, trusted professional soldier, part of a team, who not only is comfortable. We used to say in the past we wanted to be comfortable in conditions of uncertainty and ambiguity. And that over the past 12, 13 years, I've heard that a million times, comfortable. I would tell you in the future, we can't be comfortable. We have to thrive in those conditions. We have to thrive in conditions of chaos and uncertainty. So we can present, as General McMaster, I'm sure, talked to you about multiple dilemmas simultaneously uh, towards the enemy. You know, you can't just present them with one thing and solve multiple dilemmas, put the enemy, and make them react to us. Uh, and that's how we have to be. And that is a human dimension. And that is leaders who thrive in conditions of uncertainty and ambiguity. So to get there, you've got to be a whole lot more proactive in everything from physical fitness, education, training, organization, all those areas. Not much different from the great athlete. The great athletes, one thing, if we dug in this a little farther, I think you'd all agree. We, know, we call them great athletes, why? Because they thrive in those conditions of uncertainty, right? They are great athletes because when it's two outs, bottom of the ninth, it's chaos, you know, they've got to win the game, this is it, they come through, or it's, you know, Michael Jordan, or it's LeBron James, or it's a golfer. I mean, they are thriving in conditions that the average person might have trouble handling, you know, might overreact. Oh, gosh, what am I going to do? They choke, whatever. They don't choke. They're a great athlete uh, as well as a great soldier. Go to the next slide. Please take those short shorts off there. There we go. So when you look at soldier evolution, it's fascinating. On the left, World War II, we spent about $200 per soldier on average. Uh, and now there is inflation, but today we spend about $25,000 per soldier. 25,000 for their kit, their gear. 200 versus 25,000. That's more than inflation. <laughs> That's a concerted effort to protect and help that soldier. And you, we see how the world has changed. And you look at, for God's sakes, on the left, we gave them cigarettes, right? <laughs> I mean, we issued them cigarettes. Holy smokes. And really, when you think about it, no, it's true. And when you think about it, you know, we... Uh, 
we, the soldiers were treated for most of my career as a number. I mean, I hate to say that, but it was kind of like, yeah, it's an instrument, it's an instrument, okay. You know, we started to see early 2000. I was a striker brigade commander about 2002, and I remember the discussions at JBLM and, uh, and, and uh, General Jorge would be there later, continue those discussions, and around, you know, kind of, hey, you know, we got to treat soldiers uh, more proactive. Treat them like athletes. Treat them like athletes, you know, and because uh, we're, you know, first of all, the generation has changed. That guy on the left in World War II, where did they spend most of their time growing up? Outside, you know, playing sports and everything else. You know, I, I was uh, riding my mountain bike around uh, Fort Leavenworth, best small town in the Army, by the way. Just this past Saturday, it was a beautiful day. Not the high humidity, it was 70, gorgeous day. And I did like two laps, 22 miles around the base. I, I saw one child in all the, all the playground areas, all the great fenced backyards, all the tremendous areas, one child on a Saturday afternoon, two hours. And I thought, well, that's weird. Is everybody gone? No, it's a regular weekend. You know where they all were? Guess where they all were? Inside, playing video games, right? So when they come to the Army, what happens? When I was commanding Benning, we would break a lot of people because all of a sudden we started, you know, we start making them run more and do all this right away. So what do we do? We have the PRT. You know, and we, we uh, ease them into it, we do this, you know, so we realize things have changed. I mean, we are forced into this change in many ways, but it's the right thing to do in many other ways from, from left to right. There's a whole bunch of other things from left to right. I mean, think about how many in here ran in boots when you first came in the Army. You know, I mean, ran in boots. My fastest two-mile run time is in boots, you know. <laughs> that was 11.20. It wasn't bad, 11.20, but in boots. Of course, I was like 25 pounds lighter. Uh, as, a, as a cadet, but, uh, but you know, running in boots, it's crazy. And, uh, so, and then when you look, you know, just the complexity of what we do, what we ask them to do, uh, not that it was simple back then, I'm not trying to say that or take anything away from the greatest generation, they're the greatest generation, they're amazing. But things were different in the world, as I mentioned that fog of war thing. If you think about today, what we, we can't just go out and shoot any target. I mean, even something as simple as marksmanship training. We have to train discriminate fires. In fact, today, the standard is that a soldier will know in a split second whether to use force or not, right? Very, very extensive rules of engagement. And I've been out there as a commander on the ground. I mean, split second, vehicle coming at you 80 miles an hour, do you use force or not? And then we go back based on the decision they make, and we act like they had 20 minutes, 30 minutes to make this decision. You know, it's a very high standard. And it's amazing what our soldiers have done, extremely high standard. And when you think back, pretty much you had a uniformed enemy in World War II, and, and it, you know, you shoot the uniformed enemy. Uh, now, who is the enemy? Where is the enemy? You blend in, and you have to have incredible. I remember uh, our soldiers getting uh, sniper fired at them in an RPG in the middle of Mosul, a city of a couple million. You know, it's been in the news a lot lately. And they chased these insurgents in a civilian car. And uh, they started to engage the car, then the insurgents jumped out and they ran and hid behind uh, women and children in a crowd. And obviously the soldiers did not fire, they had the discipline not to fire. Now the, the good news is they were very stupid insurgents because in the car they left their wallet, uh, <laughs> variety of RPGs and stuff. So that night they did a raid and they got those guys and they did eight other simultaneous raids that night. But that's a type of discipline that we require uh, very much special forces like now in conventional because that's what's happened. You know, the special forces have gotten even more special. Conventional has gotten more like special, greater and greater requirements uh, for the soldier. Physical fitness is no different. I talked about running in boots. I mean, gosh, the first, I don't know, 20 years of my career was uh, push-up, sit-ups, and a run, right? And I have a heck of a lot better knees. I'm on knee operation number 12 right now. Oh, boy. And, uh, but if, you know, if we'd have started with like functional fitness and all these other things, I probably uh, would still be able to run, would be my guess, and not running in boots and everything else and every day pounding the pavement. Uh, so we're getting better, uh, but we've got a long ways to go. You know, I, I was just commanding First Corps uh, six months ago, and I would go out PT, and I'd see young squad leaders, great young men and women trying to do the right thing, do a CrossFit. Right? Or do a, you know, so they're not doing push ups, sit ups, and run every day. But even then, they're not trained in what to do. So they're lifting wrong and getting injured. They're overdoing it. You know, they don't have, they don't do any flexibility. They don't do any uh, agility drills. They don't, you know, so they're, they're not, they're trying to do the right thing, but they don't know what right looks like. 
we've got to help them with that as, as we move forward. And one other thing that's changed is very interesting as you're looking at this because it gets at the holistic soldier. You know, on the left, you could argue discipline has not changed. You know, some of the basics, uh, they're still there, but they have changed. Uh, they've grown more complex. Even discipline, doing the right thing when no one is watching, discipline, right? Now it's doing the right thing when the whole world is watching. Doing the right thing when the whole world is watching. Who knows who's taking a picture of you, YouTube video. I mean, it's still discipline, but it's the strategic corporal. You do the right thing when no one's watching, okay, what are the consequences? But you do the, whole, the right thing, you do the wrong thing when the whole, whole world's watching, it's on CNN that night. So huge uh, uh, differences. And part of the argument where we have to get more reactive instead of, uh, uh, proactive, excuse me, instead of reactive. We are still reactive in what they do and reacting to injuries and reacting to these things. We gotta get proactive and, and uh, so if you go to the next slide, part of it is, uh, this is the, uh, really our, our key slide for the human dimension. And when you look at our goal to optimize human performance uh, as we're looking for 2025 and beyond, I know General McMaster touched on some of that. Optimize human performance. And, that is absolutely key uh, when you look at how do you optimize human performance. And this is not just physical. Obviously, it, it, it's, uh, it goes across how you educate more effectively, how you uh, manage talent more effectively. But clearly, the physical is a huge part of it. How do you optimize human performance? And, and it is certainly not uh, from the things I was describing where it's uh, push-ups, sit-ups, and a run every day. Uh, and, and it's holistic fitness. It's total fitness. I think General Horho would say total fitness, and I agree with 110%. Mind, body, spirit, mental, you know, and I'll go into comprehensive soldier uh, and family fitness here in a minute. But optimizing human performance so that we can get to the point where, again, the people, you know, Creighton Abrams said, it's not that people are in the Army. That's kind of how we treated them, uh, the, the soldier on the left in World War II, and for quite a while, uh, people were in the Army. It's not people are in the Army. People are the Army. People are our advantage. When you look at prevent and shape, no one else can prevent and shape the way we can all over the world with individuals who are optimized. And, and uh, I saw this in first course. We sent folks. I had one, at any one time, when I left in February, so I had like 2,000 soldiers in the Pacific, in uh, Philippines, Thailand, uh, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, lucky folks in New Zealand, right? And uh, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia all company and below size elements, out there partnering. But if they're not optimized, if they're just out there as the ugly Americans, hey, shut up, we'll tell you what you need to know, they're not effective. They've got to understand that culture. They've got to have the ability to understand uh, how you, but what their needs are. What are the Malaysian army needs? How do I help you? Because if you help the Malaysian army, guess what? They can do more and then we do less, right? And it's also, as you're out there shaping you know, with, with folks all over the world, and gosh sakes, the armies are out there in, in over 125 countries right now doing the same thing. But if that individual isn't optimized, uh, you're, you're not going to get the most out of it, and you're not going to be successful uh, in, in, that, in that method. You look at the drive institutional agility. It's kind of what you're all doing here. We have to have institutions. You know, when I, was, when I was deployed, I was very proud as a striker brigade commander and later as a DCG of a division. Uh, my soldiers never lacked anything they needed, probably for the first time in history, because the support we get from the American people and, uh, you know, the, but when I come back, could I say the same thing? It's like a different world, you know, and it, it just is. You come back into, and it's one of our biggest challenges, you know, I'm responsible for mission command at the Combined Arms Center, which is key, the balance of the art and science, disciplined empowerment, trust, the most important thing, trust, that fist instead of this, trust in a unit is absolutely key, all right? But you, you can't have that, you can't have that trust if you're a bureaucracy. You know, when you're deployed, you're a professional and you're given your space, when you come back, you can't be all of a sudden a micromanager in a bureaucracy. We're talking on both sides, so this is difficult. It's different home station than it is deployed. No one's saying it's the same. But we've got to get better at closer to, it was one of the biggest challenges I had in First Corps, is these young leaders are out there empowered, doing the right thing, then they come back and we've got to avoid, you know, we get all the information we possibly can from them because we can, right? And, uh, and how do you give them that space to be the leader, to be empowered, 
to use mission command because that's if we don't do it, what are they going to do? Walk. They're going to say, forget it. And so institutional agility is key. What, what type of things am I talking about? Like for us in Trade Doc, we can be able to uh, adapt our courses faster. We find something that works. Right now, it takes forever, forever. They call it Tradosian, the Tradosian process. It's like a foreign language. And it drives me nuts. When I first came in Trade Doc, I was at uh, Benning. I had about 50 pilots going on at any one time. Because if I went through the Trade Doc process, I'd be retired wearing Velcro tennis shoes in Florida by the time things got implemented. All right? But if I'm doing pilots, I could do all these little pilots and, and something would be really good, like we did pilots on resiliency that were really good, then I'd show them to the chief of staff or the trade out commander, and it would happen. So I'm trying to create institutional agility by going around the system. We've got to have a system that is more agile and can ad adjust more rapidly uh, to keep up with the changes in the world, to keep up from our training, uh, which you see down there as well, realistic training. Do we have a force that's uh, ISIS-like that we're going against as an op four? Uh, close, but not quite. So all these areas, absolutely critical in the human dimension. Cognitive dominance is another one that I really, the next panel is going to be really exciting as they talk about all the advancements in these areas, you know, and you all know it better than anybody. We know more about the brain in the last 10 years than the last 200. And there's things we can do. Uh, I was involved as Captain Brown, 1989 at West Point, starting the first Center for Enhanced Performance. And I, I got involved with that, uh, with uh, Dr. Lewis Choka and uh, Coach Jim Young, the former football coach. Focus and concentration skills, visualization, goal setting, uh, energy management, these things. And I thought, and, and it was unbelievable the difference it would make. And I've used it my entire career. But what's also unbelievable is how long it has taken us. And it's still just on the periphery. It's a little bit in resiliency. It's a little bit there, but it's not a holistic part of what we do because you get kind of this old thing, oh, just, you know, what do people do? They go back to what they're comfortable with. And they didn't have it, so they don't think, you know, they go back to what they're comfortable with, and it's kind of old think in many cases. It's reactive, uh, it's old think, and it's not proactive as we're talking about, both in, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, education and uh, fitness, uh, in training, in, in all these areas you see up there to help us prevent shape win. Now, it's really important you see around it all is trusted teams. I'm not talking about individuals that are out there by themselves doing these things. They're part of a trusted team, and they're trusted professionals, really critical. Especially today, more so than ever, we talk about complexity uh, today again. When you look at you're facing an enemy, just have to watch the news any night here, who has no uh, morals, no ethics, uh, doesn't follow any Geneva Convention. So the pressure is even greater in our young men and women when they're out there and they see these horrible atrocities and believe me, you know, we all saw them and uh, yet you have to maintain, you cannot lower yourself to that level. You gotta maintain that. So trusted professionals is absolutely key and one of the things again uh, that we bring that is absolutely critical in the future. Okay, next uh, slide. Really, I think a, a way to be proactive is uh, CSF2, a huge way to be proactive. Yes, we have a lot of programs out there. Yes, we have to figure out which ones really work. But that's a good problem to have. Instead of we have no pro programs and we got to get them working, we got a lot working, but we've got to be more proactive. And I maintain our biggest problem with this is leaders don't understand it. Leaders do not understand it. You get an MRT who's trained, fired up, gets to the unit, and it's a rare exception that MRT is going to convince the commander to do something. It happens, but it's rare. So uh, everywhere I've been, at Benning, at JBLM, we started this leadership course in resiliency. Teach the leaders, and that's something we're working right now in all the BOLIC for all brand new lieutenants, for uh, captains in the captain's career course as a reminder, and CGSC, other. What are the leadership aspects of resiliency that will help you? Because, you know, as we we're talking about great athletes, great athletes prepare. They're resilient. They prepare for these things. Great soldiers prepare. They don't wait for something tough to happen. It's easy to lead. It's easy to be successful as you're on the up of the mountain. When you're on the down, that resiliency will bring you back. That resiliency will bring you back. And for whatever reason, over my 33 years, and I think a lot of the folks who've been around a while uh, would, would also agree, for whatever reason, it appears this generation is not as resilient as it used to be. I mean, tragically, in every command I've been in, I'm on my third major command in a row, and I, you know, I have a soldier who's doing great, 
performing extremely well, one of the best soldiers. Girlfriend will break up with them and they go off this cliff very rapidly, very, very rapidly. Uh, and sometimes tragically commit suicide or sometimes tragically do, do uh, you know, get, get a DUI or something else. So they go off that cliff very rapidly. So how, do we, how can we be more proactive to bring them back, uh, to teach them that resiliency? And it's fascinating to me as I would talk when I was uh, at Benning, we had 12,000 soldiers in training a day. And I would go out to the range and Sand Hill, there'd be three, 400 of them sitting around, I got done firing, waiting for the bus. And I would call them together and talk to them. And they'd always ask me, sir, what, what, what does it take to be a general? Of course, I'd say, obviously not good looks. That's the first thing I'd say. <laughs> and I would start to tell them all the ways I had failed. I'd talk about, you have to learn, you know, failure is a part of life and you learn from failure. And, uh, but I will tell you, this generation is more afraid of failure than any I've seen. And I've talked to professors about that at uh, schools like Duke, North Carolina, University of Kansas. They, they see the same thing. They're more afraid of failure. But you can't learn without failure. You can't grow. Uh, failure made me a much better leader along the way. But this young generation, those uh, 12,000 we're training every day, they think a general never failed. That's why they think the, cap the company commander never failed, the b battalion commander. They think they've never failed. They're just smarter than they are. They've, they've had an easier way. They were born that way, and so they're better. That's what they think. And then they fail, and it's catastrophic. Uh, some would say it's a, everybody gets a trophy generation. I don't know that I would go that extreme, but you have to teach them, and they have to understand the resilience. We have to be proactive in that, and that's, of course, in all the, uh, all the ways. And I talk here, you, you see listed aerobic fitness, endurance, strength, uh, uh, healthy body composition, flexibility. But what I really like is uh, General Horrell's uh, triad. And uh, I was fortunate enough, Commander First Corps, to volunteer for the pilot. And man, did it make a difference, I can tell you. We had a battalion. In fact, uh, I was sitting in a, uh, a briefing in the early stages, and they were talking about the Fitbit. And quite honestly, I didn't even know what a Fitbit was, right? And, uh, but they were talking about the Fitbit, and they were talking about you know, soldiers who had tried for years to lose weight and couldn't. But with the Fitbit, they were losing weight, and they could track it, et cetera. Uh, so I got a Fitbit. Now, my wife claims I'm probably the only person in the history of the world to get a Fitbit and gain weight. <laughs> the, because what I would do is I would see how many, I'd be like, hey, I'm like 5,000 over my goal, so I can have an extra ice cream sundae, you know? And <laughs> so she's trying to cure me. That's not quite how it works, and I'm, I'm trying. I blame my aide. It's all his fault. And uh, I will tell you a funny story. I did, I did get caught. Uh, anybody, anybody, how many have Fitbits in here? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so a lot of you know what I'm talking about. So I had one of those days, I was amazed. I was running around, uh, we're moving, getting ready to move. And I, oh my gosh, I was going like seven miles, just moving stuff, you know. And then another day, I was right below my goal. I mean, right there. And you know how you want to reach your goal, right? Very goal-oriented, you know. And uh, so I'm right below my goal. And of course, I'm watching a football game. So, see, I'm right below my goal. I'm right there. If I just go like this, I'll get my goal, you know. <laughs> So I'm going like this to try to get my goal. In walks my wife of 33 years, and oh my God, did I catch hell. She goes, what in the hell are you, you're cheating on your Fitbit. I said, it's not cheating, I'm burning calories. So I had nachos right there, you know? Immediately she took a picture, sent it to all three of my daughters who just gave me, I mean for like weeks they were giving me crap, so I wouldn't recommend that. So, uh, but the performance triad is exactly what we need. Sleep, you know, physical activity, uh, and, and, and clearly nutrition. And I was, in a, uh, I was in a class with NCOs who had recently redeployed. And there's about 40 of them. And I was amazed when I was first Corps commander again. I was amazed. This striker brigade had just come back within the last year. 38 of the 40 had trouble sleeping at night. 38 of the 40. Now, we're expecting them to help their soldiers with this. They don't know how to help themselves with that. And so, you know, these were not folks in the, in the program, in the trial, these were other. And, uh, and then when they asked, I think it was a, well over, it was like 30, around 30, who had to use some form of medication or alcohol or something to sleep. That is a huge problem. That is a huge problem. And then again, we're expecting them to help Private Brown. They can't help themselves. So we've got to get after this, the sleep, the physical activity, again, how we mix it up, maybe the, the total fitness and the nutrition 
I'm very happy to see in our dining facilities we've, we've gotten better chow and, uh, you know, and the right it tells you, but, you know, and, and uh, when you look at some other bright spots out there, like the Special Forces community is doing some things, you know, they, they've gone even the next step in the nutrition. They've gone the next step in the, the Thor program is a great example. It's, it's a tactical human optimization, rapid rehabilitation, reconditioning program. And I had first group there uh, was working with us at First Corn. I went to see that. And, you know, immediately what strikes you is this is fantastic. You had a uh, SF team that had come back from deployment, and they had a trainer who was working on a couple of folks who had injuries, and they tailored the program. Now, I'm comparing that to conventional. When we have folks on profile, it was my biggest problem. I'd have folks walking around post, you know, smoking a cigarette on profile, leisurely walking with headphones on. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we've got to get better uh, programs uh, for those who are recovering. And some units did it very well, others were terrible at it, and it's a major problem. But this Thor program, fantastic. Individual attention program. Then another team was preparing to deploy, and they were preparing them for where they would deploy, and, and uh, they had the ability to tailor their program for their, what they'll face in Afghanistan. And now, we can't get to that level in conventional, and I'm not saying that, but we can get close. You know, soldier-centered medical home. Get you the folks in the brigade. So they're there. So it's not one for every 12. Maybe it's one for a company, one per, you know, but you can have these programs. You can have that. We can get a heck of a lot better at it. We can train folks the right way in both sleep, physical activity, and nutrition uh, if we think about and make it a part of it, not just, oh, suck it up, Brown. You know, uh, I did it when I was young. I didn't have this stuff. You know, that's sometimes the attitude we get, quite honestly. And what I tell those folks is, and they'll, their argument will be, we have to get back to the basics. All that's nice to do stuff, and we'll do it later. All that's nice to do stuff. That's what some, some of your mid-level leaders will say. And what I would say to them is the basics have changed. That is now a basic, all right? They, the basics have changed, and, and that proactive uh, involvement is a must today because, again, you're getting a population that's different. They haven't been running around all day playing sports. They've been doing this, you know, on the computer. They're very good at that. So it's absolutely critical. Okay, go to the next slide. Yes, five minutes, okay. Almost done, I've got to, I've got to highlight here two examples of, uh, of great soldiers. Uh, on the, the left side there, the, the right side from where you're sitting, the, uh, that's uh, Staff Sergeant Matt Heisel, infantryman. Now, he had just collapsed on the top of a mountain. They went six miles, uh, 135 pounds he's carrying. Uh, that's what he's carrying in the ruck. That doesn't even count his plates and his other items. Uh, six miles from an elevation of 7,000 to 10,000 feet. Uh, this young man uh, happens to be my driver right now, an amazing young leader, came in after 911, uh, served with the 82nd in Afghanistan and served with the 101st. In fact, in the famed uh, Band of Brothers company, uh, Delta company, a dog company there, the same company that's in the Band of Brothers. And when you look at that, He's, you know, his stakes are much greater than any professional athlete. If we're not proactive with a young leader like that uh, and, and uh, what he's got to face every other day for a year, uh, hiking up those uh, mountains as a, as a squad leader. And, oh, by the way, it, they didn't get, like, two years to train their squad. the 101st, and he had his, uh, the squad leader, his team leaders, and seven new soldiers arrived in country, in country. So how important is that basic training that we get it right and we're proactive before they get there because they arrived in country. And the uh, young lady there winning the Marine Corps Marathon, uh, Captain Kelly Coway, intel officer, eight years of service, two deployments, one of the first, if not the first, female S2 in an infantry battalion deployed, uh, company commander. She uh, last year won the Marine Corps Marathon and uh, was 25th in the Olympic trials in 2012 with a 237 marathon, not bad. Uh, all 24 people that beat her were professionals, by the way, and she's, uh, again, serving uh, full-time, dual military couple, uh, husband's a captain. He deployed three times, she's deployed two times. Now, these are the type of folks we, we have out there that deserve to be treated better than professional athletes, and that's my oldest daughter. <laughs> I was saving that, sir, but all right. But yeah, the, uh, so uh, Kelly's my oldest daughter, uh, married, so has a different last name, but I'm obviously pretty proud of her. Thank God she takes after her mother. That's what I would say. All right, next slide, final slide. And uh, so what's the road ahead? Again, proactive, 
The world has changed. We've got to change with it. We need soldiers that thrive in conditions of chaos and conditions of uncertainty. That means uh, that physically they can do it, mentally they can do it. We have to be more proactive, not just the same old stuff, not nice to do, essential that we get this done and we work together to figure that out. You know, there, there's, uh, there are bright ink spots out there of this happening. We've got to take those ink spots and spread them across the force, the, the triad program, the pilot, and these, these have to spread everywhere. And it's going to take a concern, it's going to take that institutional agility I talked about, the ability to make it happen rapidly, not 20 years from now, but right away, so we can maintain our advantage as the best army in the world, truly optimize human performance and have a hedge against this complexity for the future. Because people, the right leaders, can do anything. The right soldiers, the army is people, and the right leaders can accomplish anything. The equipment can't keep up, ever. We all know that. It takes forever and it can't keep up. We need equipment. We need the best equipment. But the people are what's going to make us successful in the, in the future. So I'll, uh, I'll end there and take any questions you have.